Now from the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., author Andrew Bostom discusses his book, The Legacy of Anti-Semitism. Mr. Bostom draws on scholarly journals and sacred texts to argue that Islamic anti-Semitism is rooted in Islam's foundational texts. This program is two hours. Um, um, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today um, to the Hudson Institute. Uh, my name is Hillel Fratkin. I direct... Uh, the Center on Islam, Democracy, and the Future of the Muslim World here at the Hudson Institute. Um, we're here today uh, for a presentation and discussion of a new book. Um, the leg- <clears throat> Let me make sure I have the title correctly. The Legacy of Muslim Islamic Anti-Semitism. Um, and we have with us uh, the author of that book, uh, Dr. Andrew uh, Boston. Um, I have the, uh, I, my own role here today is to be, serve as both moderator and commentator. Uh, uh, we'll see how much moderation I can exercise with respect to myself. Uh, but it all, but at a minimum it means I'll probably wind up repeating myself. Um, Dr. Boston, um, I should say, is a real doctor. Um, and uh, is a uh, doctor of internal medicine. And uh, should anyone um, uh, get ill today, uh, please call on him. Uh, I will be happy to handle him his stethoscope and whatever else he may need for, um, for treating you. Um, Dr. Bossom is also uh, the author of a book called The Legacy of Jihad, um, and this book, the present book, I suppose one could say, is uh, in some sense a continuation of that, that work and grew out of it. Um, I will surely turn o- over the, the mic to uh, Dr. Boston, and uh, who will uh, make a presentation, and then I will comment on it uh, afterwards. Uh, I should say, first of all, by way of introduction, that Dr. Boston and his book have done us a service By us, I mean we American citizens. Since 9-11, we have all known that there is a movement and force in the world, often known as radical Islam, which has attacked us, means to attack us again, and would like, if possible, to destroy us. And in our struggle to defend ourselves from this enemy and to defeat him, we need to understand it as best we can in all its aspects. One of these elements is the fervor of its hatred of Jews. We need to understand this, whether or not we are Jews, precisely because it seems to be a very powerful element of its worldview, and we need to understand that view as a whole. Of course, if we are Jews, we have an additional reason for understanding this. Uh, And I will add here, and as I will indicate later on, I think there is another group which has a very powerful interest and need to reflect upon the phenomenon of uh, contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism, and that group is Muslims themselves. Um, Returning to uh, Americans, uh, we Americans, let me say that we also need to understand the relationship of this movement to other forms of Islam and other aspects of the Muslim world. Uh, We do not, at least uh, I know I don't, seek a struggle, mortal or otherwise, with the Muslim world. Indeed, we did not seek a struggle with radical Islam itself. Our prospects of avoiding a more general struggle are improved, though certainly not guaranteed, the better we understand it. Dr. Boston has undertaken his work, written this book, and is here with us today, to make a contribution to that understanding. Dr. Boston. Is this working? Okay. Thanks very much for that introduction, Hillel. Uh, My presentation uh, today will introduce evidence adduced to considerably greater extent uh, in the legacy of Islamic anti-Semitism, 
which elucidates how the uniquely Islamic institution of jihad war, its corollary institution, dimitude, and specific anti-Semitic motifs in Islamic theology, including Islamic eschatology, operate in tandem with regard to global jihadist aspirations and the annihilationist Muslim Jew hatred directed at the Jews of Israel. In April 1948, the Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sheikh Mohammed Mahawif, issued a fatwa declaring jihad in Palestine obligatory for all Muslims. The Jews, he maintained, intended to, quote, take over all the lands of Islam, unquote. Eight years later, a fatwa written July 5, 1956, by then Grand Mufti of Egypt, Sheikh Mohammed Hassan Mamoun, and signed by the members of the Fatwa Committee of Al-Azhar and the major representatives of all four Islamic schools of jurisprudence, elaborated the following. Quote, the question put to us reveals that the land of Palestine has been conquered by the Muslims, i.e. by jihad in the 7th century, who have lived there for a long time and has become part of the Muslim territory where minorities of other religions dwell. Accordingly, Palestine has become a territory under the jurisdiction of Islam and governed by Islamic laws. The question further reveals that Jews have taken a part of Palestine and there established their non-Islamic government and have also evacuated from that part most of its Muslim inhabitants. In this case, the jihad is the duty of all Muslims, not just for those who can undertake it. And since all Islamic countries constitute the abode of every Muslim, the jihad is imperative for both the Muslims inhabiting the territory attacked and Muslims everywhere else because even though some sections have not been attacked directly, the attack nevertheless took place on a part of the Muslim territory which is a legitimate residence for any Muslim. Muslims cannot conclude peace with those Jews who have usurped the territory of Palestine and attacked its people and their property in any manner which allows the Jews to continue as a state in that sacred Muslim territory. Muslims should cooperate regardless of differences in language, color, or race to restore the country to its people. Everyone knows that from the early days of Islam to the present day, the Jews have been plotting against Islam and Muslims and Islamic homeland. They do not propose to be content with the attack they made on Palestine in Al-Aqsa Mosque, but they plan for the possession of all Islamic territories from the Nile to the Euphrates, unquote. Just this past Friday, May 16th, 2008, Osama bin Laden's latest reputed audio message proclaimed, quote, the jihad holy war, which he emphasized, quote, is a duty to free Palestine is the most important issue for the Islamic nation, unquote, and he urged, quote, iron and fire, unquote, to end Israel's self-defensive blockade of Gaza. Earlier remarks of Hamas MP and cleric Yunus Alastal, which aired on Palestinian Al-Aqsa TV April 8, 2008, provide complementary and even more revealing context. Quote, Very soon, Allah willing, Rome will be conquered, just like Constantinople was, as was prophesied by our prophet Muhammad. Today, Rome is the capital of the Catholics, or the Crusader capital, which has declared its hostility to Islam and has planted the brothers of apes and pigs, i.e. Jews, according to Quran 265, 560, and 7166, has planted the brothers of apes and pigs in Palestine in order to prevent the reawakening of Islam. This capital of theirs, Rome, will be an advanced, out, advanced post for the Islamic conquests, which will spread through Europe in its entirety, and then will turn to the two Americas, and even Eastern Europe. I believe that our children or our grandchildren will inherit our jihad, unquote. These words debunk widely accepted tropes that Hamas is merely a nationalist movement, albeit religious, desiring a Palestinian homeland in the territories of Gaza, which it already possesses, Judea and Samaria. Hamas's blatantly annihilationist rhetoric towards Jews and Israel within the 1949 armistice borders indicates that the jihadist organization wishes to replace Israel. Why then, in addition to the monotonous rhetoric of Jew hatred, which is specifically Quranic in origin, the unabashed expression of Hamas's will to wage global jihad. Apparently, even the still apposite lessons from America's own first encounter with jihadism have failed to resonate in the current era. Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, then serving as American ambassadors to France and Britain, respectively, met in 1786 in London with the Tripolitan, modern Libya, uh, ambassador to Britain, Sidi Haji Abdul Rahman Aja. These future American presidents 
were attempting to negotiate a peace treaty which would spare the United States the ravages of jihad piracy, murder, enslavement with ransoming for redemption, and expropriation of valuable commercial assets emanating from the Barbary states. That would be modern Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. During their discussions, they questioned Ambassador Adja as to the source of the unprovoked animus directed at the nascent United States Republic. Jefferson and Adams, in their subsequent report to the Continental Congress, recorded the Tripolitan ambassador's justification. Here's what he said. Quote, and this is from a wonderful book by Joshua London, uh, quote, that it was founded on the laws of their prophet, that it was written in their Koran, that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners, that it was their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found, and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim, this is 18th century parlance for Muslim, who should be slain in battle was sure to go to paradise, unquote. Thus, an aggressive jihad was already being waged against the United States almost 200 years prior to America becoming a dominant international power in the Middle East. Moreover, these jihad depredations targeting America antedated the earliest vestiges of the Zionist movement by a century and the formal creation of Israel by 162 years exploding the ahistorical canard that American support for the modern Jewish state is a prerequisite for jihadist attacks on the United States. There is just one historically relevant meaning of jihad, despite contemporary apologetics. The root of the word jihad appears 40 times in the Quran and in subsequent Islamic understanding to both Muslim luminaries from the greatest jurists and scholars of classical Islam, including people such as Abu Yusuf, Averroes, Ibn Khaldun, and al-Ghazali, to ordinary people meant and means he fought, warred, or waged war against unbelievers and the like. As described by the seminal Arabic lexicographer E.W. E. W. Lane, quote, jihad came to be used by the Muslims to signify waging war against unbelievers, unquote. Muhammad himself waged a series of proto-jihad campaigns to subdue the Jews, Christians, and pagans of Arabia. Numerous modern-day pronouncements by leading Muslim the theologians, such as Yusuf al-Qaradawi's The Prophet Muhammad as a Jihad Model, confirm that Muhammad has been the major inspiration for jihadism past and present. Ibn Khaldun, who died in 1406, a jurist, renowned philosopher, historian, and sociologist, summarized these consensus opinions from five centuries of prior Muslim jurisprudence with regard to the uniquely Islamic institution of jihad. Here's what Ibn Khaldun said. In the Muslim community, the holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and the obligation to convert everybody to Islam either by, for, uh, either by persuasion or by force. The other religious groups did not have a universal mission, and the holy war was not a religious duty for them, save only for purposes of defense. Islam is under obligation to gain power over other nations, unquote. Classical jurists, such as Ibn Khaldun, also formulated the concepts Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, Arabic for the House of Islam and the House of War. As described by the great 20th century scholar of Islamic law, Joseph Schacht, quote, a non-Muslim who is not protected by a treaty is called Harbi in a state of war, enemy alien. His life and property are completely unprotected by law, unquote. Yusuf al-Qaradawi, spiritual leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, head of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, and popular Al Jazeera television personality, reiterated almost this exact formulation of Dar al-Harb during July 2003, both in conceptual terms and with regard to Israel specifically. And these innocent non-combatant Harbies can be killed and have always been killed with impunity, simply by virtue of being Harbies during endless razias or raids, and full-scale jihad campaigns that have occurred continuously since the time of Muhammad through the present. This is the crux of the specific institutionalized religio-political ideology, i.e. jihad, which makes Islamdom's borders and the further reaches of today's jihad jihadists bloody, to paraphrase Samuel Huntington across the globe. The essential pattern of the jihad war is captured in the classical Muslim historian Al-Tabari's recording of the recommendation given by Umar bin al-Khattab, the second rightly guided caliph, to the commander of the troops he sent to al-Basra in 636 CE during the conquest of Iraq. Umar reportedly said the following, quote, Summon the people to God. Those who respond to your call, accept it from them. But those who refuse must pay the poll tax out of humiliation and lowliness, Quran 929. If they refuse this, it is the sword without leniency, unquote. By the time of Tabari's death in 923, 
Jihad wars had expanded the Muslim empire from Portugal to the Indian subcontinent. Subsequent Muslim conquests continued in Asia as well as Eastern Europe. Under the banner of Jihad, the Christian kingdoms of Armenia, Byzantium, Bulgaria, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, and Albania, in addition to parts of Poland and Hungary, were also conquered and Islamized by waves of Seljuk, or later Ottoman Turks, as well as Tatars. Arab Muslim invaders engaged additionally in continuous jihad raids that ravaged and enslaved sub-Saharan African animist populations extending to the southern Sudan. When the Ottoman Muslim armies were stopped at the gates of Vienna in 1683, over a millennium of jihad had transpired. These tremendous military successes spawned a triumphalist jihad literature. Muslim historians recorded in detail the number of infidels slaughtered or enslaved and deported, the cities, villages, and infidel religious sites which were sacked and pillaged, and the lands, treasure, and movable goods seized. And this classical formulation of jihad is very much a living doctrine today. For example, one can read the openly espoused views and sound Islamic arguments which conclude the contemporary work Islam and Modernism, written by a respected modern Muslim scholar, Justice Muhammad Taki Usmani. Mr. Usmani, age 64, sat for 20 years as a Sharia judge in Pakistan's Supreme Court. His father was the uh, Grand Mufti of Pakistan and, and one of the most important 20th century uh, Quranic commentators. His name was Maul Maulana Mufti Muhammad Shafi. Currently, Usmani, the son, is deputy of the Islamic Fiqh, or Jurisprudence Council, of the Organization of the Islamic Conference, the major international body of Islamic nations in the world, and serves as an advisor to several global Sharia-based Islamic financial institutions. Thus, he is a leading contemporary figure in the world of mainstream Islamic jurisprudence. Mr. Usmani is also a regular visitor to Britain. During a recent visit there, he was interviewed by the Times of London, which published extracts from Usmani's writings on jihad Saturday, September 8, 2007. The concluding chapter of Usmani's Islam and Modernism rebuts those who believe that only defensive jihad, i.e. fighting to defend a Muslim land deemed under attack or occupation, is permissible in Islam. He also refutes the suggestion that jihad is unlawful against a non-Muslim state that freely permits the preaching of Islam, which not surprisingly was of some concern to the Times reporter. Uh, for Mr. Usmani, quote, the question is whether aggressive battle is by itself commendable or not. If it is, why should the Muslims stop simply because territorial expansion in these days is regarded as bad? And if it is not commendable but deplorable, why did Islam not stop it in the past? Unquote. He answers his own question as follows. Quote, Even in those days, aggressive jihads were waged because it was truly commendable for establishing the grandeur of the religion of Allah. Unquote. Usmani argues that Muslims should live peacefully in countries such as Britain, where they have the freedom to practice Islam, only until they gain enough power to engage in battle. Isma Usmani explodes the myths that the creed of offensive expansionist jihad represents a distortion of traditional Islamic thinking, or that this living institution is somehow irrelevant to our era. And what was the nature of the system of governance imposed upon those indigenous non-Muslims conquered by jihad? In his seminal The Laws of Islamic Governance, al-Mawardi, who died in 1058, a renowned jurist of Baghdad, examined the regulations pertaining to the lands and infidel populations subjugated by jihad. This is the origin of the system of dimitude. The native infidel dimi, which derives uh, from both the word for pact uh, and also guilt, guilty of religious errors. The native infidel dimi, pop dimi population had to recognize Islamic ownership of their land, submit to Islamic law, and accept payment of the Quranic poll tax, the jizya, the tax paid in lieu of being slain, based on Quran 929. Al-Mawardi notes that, quote, the enemy makes a payment in return for peace and reconciliation. Reconciliation and security last as long as the payment is made. If the payment ceases, then the jihad resumes, unquote. A treaty of reconciliation may be renewable, but must not exceed 10 years. This same basic formulation was reiterated during a January 8, 1998 interview by Yusuf al-Qaradawi, confirming how jihad continues to regulate the relations between Muslims and non-Muslims to this day. The contract of the jizya, or dhimma, encompassed other obligatory and recommended obligations for the conquered non-Muslim dhimmi peoples. 
Collectively, these obligations formed a discriminatory system of dimitude imposed upon non-Muslims, Jews, Christians, as well as Zoroastrians, Hindus, and Buddhists, subjugated by jihad. Some of the more salient features of dimitude include the prohibition of arms for the vanquished dhimmis and of church bells, restrictions concerning the building and restoration of churches, synagogues, and temples, inequality between Muslims and non-Muslims with regard to taxes and penal law, the refusal of dhimmi testimony by Muslim courts, a requirement that Jews, Christians, and other non-Muslims, including Zoroastrians and Hindus, wear special clothes, and the overall humiliation and abasement of non-Muslims. It is important to note that these regulations and attitudes were institutionalized as permanent features of the sacred Islamic law, or Sharia. The writings of the much lionized Sufi theologian and jurist Al-Ghazali, who died in 1111, highlight how the institution of dimitude was simply a normative and prominent feature of the Sharia. Here's what Ghazali wrote. Quote, the dhimmi is obliged not to mention Allah or his apostle. Jews, Christians, and Magians, probably Zoroastrians, must pay the jizya, the poll tax on non-Muslims. On offering up the jizya, the dhimmi must hang his head while the official takes hold of his beard and hits the dhimmi on the protuberant bone beneath his ear, probably the mandible. They are not permitted to ostentatiously display their wine or church bells, their houses may not be higher than the Muslims, no matter how low that is. The dhimmi may not ride an elegant horse or mule. He may ride a donkey, only if the saddle work is of wood. He may not walk on the good part of the road. They, the dhimmis, have to wear an identifying patch on their clothing, even women and even in the public baths. Dhimmis must hold their tongue. The practical consequences of such a discriminatory system were, uh, were summarized in A.S. Triton's 1930, The Caliphs and Their Non-Muslim Subjects, a pioneering treatise on the status of the dhimmis. Here's what Triton wrote. Quote, Caliphs destroyed churches to obtain materials for their buildings, and the mob was always ready to pillage churches and monasteries. Dhimmis always lived on sufferance, exposed to the caprices of the ruler and the passions of the mob. In later times, they were much liable to suffer from the violence of the crowd, and the popular fanaticism was accompanied by an increasing strictness among the educated. The spiritual isolation of Islam was accomplished, the world was divided into two classes, Muslims and others, and only Islam counted. Indeed, the general feeling was that the leavings of the Muslims were good enough for the dhimmis, unquote. It is within this overall historical context that one must view contemporary Muslim pronouncements regarding the status of non-Muslims under past, present, and future Islamic rule. For example, during a Friday sermon broadcasted live on June 6, 2001, on PATV from the Sheikh uh, Ijlan Mosque in Gaza, Palestinian Authority employee Sheikh Mohammed Ibrahim al-Mahdi reiterated these sentiments with regard to Jews. Here's what he said. We welcome, as we did in the past, any Jew who wants to live in this land as a dhimmi, just as the Jews have lived in our countries as dhimmis and have earned appreciation, and some of them have even reached the positions of counselor or minister here and there. We welcome the Jews to live as dhimmis, but the rule in this land and in all the Muslim countries must be the rule of Allah, unquote. Five years ago, uh, i.e. in 2003, prior to Hamas's electoral victory in 2006, during a briefing for a visiting United States congressional delegation, then Vatican representative to Israel, Archbishop Pietro Sambi, informed U.S. lawmakers that the Palestinian Authority's new approved state constitution, funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, provided no juridical status for any religion other than Islam in the emerging Palestinian Arab entity. The papal nuncio warned, in addition, that the Palestinian Authority had adopted Sharia as the overarching guiding principle of their legal code, thus mandating the absolute supremacy of Muslims over non-Muslims as a matter of law. Archbishop Sambi also initiated a study of the new PA textbooks, which the Vatican deemed to be brazenly anti-Semitic. But how are the jihad and its corollary institution, dimitude, conjoined to Islamic anti-Semitism? Listen to what another Palestinian cleric, Wael al-Zarad, intoned about the Jews of Israel during a TV program which aired on Al-Aqsa TV on February 28, 2008. Quote, by Allah, if each and every Arab spat on them, they would drown in Arab spit. By Allah, if each and every Muslim spat on them, they would drown in saliva, unquote. While El al-Zarad's seemingly hallucinatory statement also included this allegation, quote, from the dome of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, they proclaim that Ezra the scribe is the son of God, unquote. 
The reference to Ezra is actually a false, intentionally defamatory Quranic accusation, Quran 930, against Jews, citing a claim which Jews, in fact, have never made. But the crux of Al-Zarad's remarks explain that the Muslims' blood vengeance against the Jews, quote, will only subside with their, the Jews' annihilation, Allah willing, because they tried to kill our prophet several times, unquote. These allegations are part of a central anti-Semitic motif in the Quran, which decrees an eternal curse upon the Jews, Quran 261, reiterated at 3112, for slaying the prophets and transgressing against the will of Allah. It should be noted that Quran 3112 is featured in the preamble to Hamas's foundational covenant. It's one of the first things you see when you read the covenant. This central motif is coupled to Quranic verses 560 and 578, which describe the Jews' transformation into apes and swine in 560, or simply apes, verses 265 and 7166, having been, quote, cursed by the tongue of David and Jesus Mary's son, and that's verse 578. Muhammad himself repeats this Quranic curse in a canonical hadith. And the related verse, 564, accuses the Jews, as Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas did in a January 2007 speech citing Quran 564, of being, quote, spreaders of war and corruption, unquote, a sort of Quranic antecedent of the protocols of the elders of Zion. The centrality of the Jews' permanent abasement and humiliation, being laden with God's anger, in the corpus of Muslim exegetic literature on Quran 261-3112, is clear. By nature deceitful and treacherous, the Jews rejected Allah's signs and prophets, including Isa, the Muslim Jesus. Classical Quranic commentators such as Tabari, Zamakshari, Badawi, and Ibn Kathir, when discussing Quran 582, which includes the statement, quote, thou, thou wilt surely find the most hostile of men to the believers are the Jews, concur on the unique animus of the Jews towards the Muslims, which is repeatedly linked to Quran 261-3112. For example, in his commentary on 582, Tabari writes, quote, In my opinion, the Christians are not like the Jews, who always scheme in order to murder the emissaries and prophets, and who oppose God in his positive and negative commandments, and who corrupt his scripture, which he revealed in his books, unquote. Tabari's classical interpretations of Quran 582 and 261, as well as his discussion of the related verse 929, mandating the Jews' payment of the jizya, the, the Quranic poll tax, represent both anti-Semitic and more general anti-Dimi views that became and remain intrinsic to Islam to this day. Here is Tabari's discussion of 261 and its relationship to verse 929, which emphasizes the purposely debasing nature of the Quranic poll tax. Here's what he says. Abasement and poverty were laid, I'm sorry, were imposed and laid down upon them as when someone says the imam imposed the poll tax on non-Muslim subjects, or the man imposed land tax on his slave, meaning thereby that he obliged him to pay it, or the commander imposed a sortie on his troops, meaning he made it their duty. God commanded his, his believing servants not to give them, the non-Muslim the non people of the scripture, security, as long as they continued to disbelieve in him and his messenger, unless they paid the poll tax to them. God said, and he just quotes Quran 929, uh, fight those who believe not in God and the last day and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden. Uh, such men as practice not the religion of truth, Islam, being of those who have been given the book, the Bible, until they po pay the poll tax, being humble. That's Quran 929. He just cites that, and then he says, the dhimmis, the non-Muslim tributaries, posture during the collection of the jizya should be lowering themselves by walking on their hand reluctantly. His words, an abasement and poverty were imposed upon them. These, these, are, uh, these are the Jews of the children of Israel. Are they the cops of Egypt? What have the cops of Egypt to do with this? No, by God they are not. But they are the Jews, the children of Israel. By and slain the prophets rightfully, he means that they used to kill the messengers of God without God's leave, denying their messages and rejecting their prophethood. Indeed, the Quran's overall discussion of the Jews is marked by a litany of their sins and punishments, as if part of a divine in, uh, indictment, conviction, and punishment process. The Jews wrong themselves by losing faith and breaking their covenant. The Jews, echo and, echoing an anti-Nicene, uh, Marcionite polemic, are a nation that has passed away. Twice Allah sent his instruments, the Assyrians or Babylonians and Romans, to punish this perverse people. Their dispersal over the earth is proof of Allah's rejection. 
the Jews are further warned about their arrogant claim that they remain Allah's chosen people and continue disobedience and corruption. Other sins, some repeated, are enumerated. Abuse, even killing of prophets, including Isa, the Muslim Jesus, is a consistent theme. The Jews ridiculed Muhammad as Raina, the evil one, and they are also accused of lacking, uh, of being lacking in faith, taking words out of context, disobedience, and distortion. Precious few of them are believers. These perverse creatures also claim that Ezra is the Messiah, and they worship rabbis who defraud men of their possessions. Additional sins are described. The Jews are typified as an envious people whose hearts are hardened as rocks. They are further accused of confounding the truth, deliberately perverting scripture, and being liars. These are all Quranic citations. Ill-informed people of little faith, for example, Quran 289. They pursue vague and wishful fancies. Other sins have contributed to their being stamped with wretchedness, abasement, and humiliation, as discussed earlier, including such things as usury, sorcery, hedonism, and idol worship. More and repeat sins are described still. The Jews' idol worship is again mentioned, and then linked and followed by charges of other often repeat iniquities, the tremendous calumny against Mary in Quran 4.156, as well as usury and and, and cheating. Most Jews are accused of being evil livers, transgressors, ungodly, who, deceived by their own lies, will turn, to Muslim, will turn Muslims from Islam. Jews are blind and deaf to the truth, and, and what they have not forgotten, they have perverted. They mislead, confound the truth, twist tongues, and cheat Gentiles without remorse. Muslims are advised not to take the Jews as friends, Quran 551, and to beware of the inveterate hatred that Jews bear toward, toward them, as, as I discussed earlier, 582. The Jews' ultimate sin and, punish, ultimate sin and punishment are made clear. They are the devil's minions. Cursed by Allah, their faces will be obliterated, and, they, and if they do not accept the true faith of, the true faith of Islam, the, uh, the Jews who understand their faith become Muslims, in fact, at 3.113, they will be made into apes, or apes and swine, and burn in the hellfires. The Quranic curse upon the Jews for primarily rejecting, even slaying Allah's prophets, including Isa, Jesus, or at least his body double, is updated with perfect archetypal logic in the canonical Hadith. Following the Muslims' initial conquest of the Jewish farming oasis of Kaibar, one of the vanquished Jewesses reportedly served Muhammad poisoned mutton, or or goat, which resulted ultimately in his protracted, agonizing death. And Ibn Sa'd's Sira account, one of the earliest pious Muslim biographies of Muhammad, maintains that Muhammad's poisoning resulted from a well-coordinated Jewish conspiracy. It is worth recounting, as depicted in the Muslim sources, the events that antedated Muhammad's reputed poisoning at Kaibar. Muhammad's failures or incomplete successes were consistently recompensed by murderous attacks on the Jews. The Muslim prophet warrior developed a penchant for assassinating individual Jews and destroying Jewish communities by expropriation and expulsion of the Banu Kainuka and Banu Nadir, or massacring their men and enslaving their women uh, and children, the Banu Qurayza. Just before subduing the Medinan Jewish tribe, Banu Qurayza, and orchestrating the mass execution of their adult males, Muhammad invoked perhaps the most striking Quranic motif uh, for the Jews' debasement. He addressed these Jews with hateful disparagement as, you brothers of apes. Subsequently, in the case of the Kaibar Jews, Muhammad had the male leadership killed and plundered their riches. The terrorized Kaibar survivors, industrious Jewish farmers, became prototype subjugated dhimmis whose productivity was extracted by the Muslims as a form of permanent booty. And according to to the Muslim sources, even this tenuous vassalage was arbitrarily terminated within a decade of Muhammad's death when Caliph Umar expelled the Jews of Kaibar. Thus Maimonides, who died in 1203, renowned Talmudist, philosopher, astronomer, and physician, as noted by the great historian Salah Baron, emphasizes the bellicose madness of Muhammad and his quest for political control. Muhammad's mindset and the actions it engendered had immediate and long-term tragic consequences for Jews, from his massacring up to 24,000 Jews to their chronic oppression, as described in the Islamic sources by Muslims themselves. Here's Barron's summary of Maimonides' thought. Following an uh, apparently prevalent usage, Maimonides calls the founder of Islam a madman, meshuga is the Hebrew word, uh, pregnant with connotations, with, with both religious and political aspirations, who failed to formulate any new religious ideas, but merely restated well-known concepts. Nevertheless, he attracted a large following and inflicted many wrongs upon the Jews, being himself responsible for the massacre of 24,000. 
Following his example, the Muslims of the subsequent generations oppressed the Jews and debased them even more harshly than any other nation, unquote. Muhammad's brutal conquest and subjugation of the Medinan and Kaibar Jews and their subsequent expulsion by one of his companions, the second rightly guided uh, Caliph Umar, epitomized permanent archetypal behavior patterns, Islamic law, deemed appropriate to Muslim interactions with Jews. George Vida's seminal analysis of the anti-Jewish motifs in the Hadith remains the definitive work on this, on this subject. And one of the things I was able to contribute in this volu- volume is the first full-time uh, English translation of this magnificent 1937 essay. Vida concluded that according to the Hadith, stubborn malevolence is the Jews' defining worldly characteristic. Rejecting Muhammad and refusing to convert to Islam out of jealousy, envy, and even selfish personal interest led them to acts of treachery in keeping with their inveterate nature. As Vita summarizes it, sorcery, poisoning, assassination held no scruples for them. These archetypes sanctioned Muslim hatred towards the Jews and the admonition to at best, quote, subject the Jews to Muslim domination as dhimmis treated with contempt under certain humiliating arrangements. Two particularly humiliating vocations that were imposed upon Jews by their Muslim overlords in Yemen and Morocco, where Jews formed the only substantive non-Muslim dhimmi populations, merit elaboration. Moroccan Jews were confined to ghettos in the major cities, uh, such as Fez, since the 13th century, called melas, a salty earth, which, de- which derives from the fact that it was here that they were forced to salt the decapitated heads of executed rebels for public exposition. This brutally imposed humiliating practice which could be enforced even on the Jewish Sabbath, persisted through the late 19th century, as described by Eliezer Bashan. Quote, In the 1870s, Jews were forced to salt the decapitated heads of rebels on the Sabbath. For example, Berber tribes frequently revolted against Sultan Muhammad XVIII. In order to force them to accept his authority, he would engage in punitive military campaigns. Among the tribes were the Musa, located south of Marrakesh. In 1872, the Sultan succeeded in quelling their revolt, and 48 of their captives were condemned condemned to death. In October 1872, on the order of the Sultan, they were dispatched to Rabat for beheading. Their decapitated heads were to be exposed on the gates of the town for three days. Since the heads were to be sent to Fez, Jewish ritual slaughterers of of livestock uh, were forced to salt them and hang them for exposure on the Sabbath. Despite threats by the governor of Rabat, the Jews refused to do so. He then ordered soldiers to enter the homes of those who refused and dragged them outside. After they were flogged, the Jews complied and performed the task, and the heads of the rebels were exposed to, uh, in public, unquote. Yemenite Jews had to remove human feces and other waste matter, urine which failed to evaporate, etc., from Muslim areas, initially in Sana and later in other communities such as uh, Shivam, Yarim, and, and Damar. Decrees requiring this obligation were issued in the late 18th or early 19th century and reintroduced in 1913. Yehuda Nini reproduces an 1874 letter written by a Yemenite Jew to the uh, Alliance Israelite in Paris lamenting the practice. Here's the quote from the letter. It is 86 years since our forefathers suffered the cruel decree and great shame to the nation of Israel uh, from the east to sundown. For in the days of our fathers, 86 years ago, there arose a judge known as Qadi and said unto the king and his ministers who lived in that time that the Lord, blessed be he, had only created the Jews uh, out of love of the other nations to do their work and be enslaved by them at their will and to do the most contemptible and lowly of tasks. And of them all, the greatest uh, contamination of all, to clear their privies and streets and pathways of the filthy dung and the great filth in that place, and to collect all that is left of the dung, may your honor pardon the expression, unquote. And when Jews were perceived as having exceeded the rightful bounds of this subjected relationship, as in mythically tolerant Muslim Spain, the results were predictably tragic. The Grenadian Jewish viziers, Samuel Ibn Negrella, and his son Joseph, who protected the Jewish community, were both assassinated between 1056 to 1066, and in the aftermath, the Jewish population was annihilated by the local Muslims. It is estimated that up to 4,000 Jews perished in the pogrom by Muslims that, that accompanied the 1066 assassination. This figure equals or exceeds the number of Jews reportedly killed by the Crusaders during their pillage of the Rhineland some 30 years later at the outset of the First Crusade. The inciting rationale for this Grenadian pogrom is made 
clear in the bitter anti-Jewish ode of Abu Ishaq, a well-known Muslim jurist and poet of the times who wrote the following. Bring them down to their place and return them to the most abject station. They used to roam around us in tatters, covered with contempt, humiliation, and scorn. They used to rummage amongst the dung heaps for a bit of a filthy rag to serve as a shroud for a man to be buried in. Do not consider that killing them is treachery. Nay, it would be treachery to leave them scoffing, unquote. Abu Ishaq's rhetorical incitement to violence also included the line, quote, many a pious Muslim is in awe of the vilest infidel ape, unquote. Moshe Perlman, in his analysis of the Muslim anti-Jewish po- polemic of 11th century Grenada, notes, Abu Ishaq used the epithet ape profusely when referring to Jews. Such indeed was the parlance. Perlman then cites the related Quranic passages upon which so, uh, such nomenclature was based. The Moroccan cleric al Magili, who died in 1505, referring to the Jews as brothers of apes, uh, just as Muhammad, the sacralized prototype, had addressed the Banu Qurayza, who, who repeatedly blasphemed the Muslim prophet and whose overall conduct reflected their hatred of Muslims, fomented and then personally led a Muslim pogrom in about 1490 against the Jews of the southern Moroccan o- oasis of, of Tuat, plundering and killing them en masse and destroying their synagogue in neighboring Tamanti. An important Muslim theologian whose writings influenced Moroccan religious attitudes towards Jews into the 20th century, al Magili also declared in verse, love of the prophet requires hatred of the Jews. The annihilationist sentiments regarding Jews, as expressed by Hamas cleric al-Zarad, and incorporated permanently into the foundational 1988 Hamas charter, are also rooted in Islamic eschatology. As characterized in the Hadith, Muslim eschatology highlights the Jews' supreme hostility to Islam. Jews are described as adherents of the Dajjal, the Muslim equivalent of the Antichrist, or according to another tradition, the Dajjal is himself Jewish. At his appearance, other traditions maintain that the Dajjal will be accompanied by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan, wrapped in their robes and armed with polished sabers, their heads covered with a sort of veil. When the Dajjal is defeated, his Jewish companions will be slaughtered. Everything will deliver them up except for the so-called Garkad tree, as per the canonical hadith included in, in the 1988 Hamas Charter in Article 7. Another hadith variant, which uh, takes place in Jerusalem, has Isa, the Muslim Jesus, leading the Arabs in a rout of the Dajjal and his accompanying 70,000 armed Jews. And the notion of jihad ransom extends even into Islamic eschatology. On the day of resurrection, the vanquished Jews will be consigned to hellfire, and this will expiate Muslims who have sinned, sparing them from this fate. The rise of Jewish nationalism, Zionism, posed a predictable, if completely unacceptable, challenge to the Islamic order. Jihad imposed chronic dimitude for Jews of apocalyptic magnitude. As, as historian Batyor has explained, quote, because divine will dooms Jews to wandering and misery, the Jewish state appears to Muslims as an unbearable affront and a sin against Allah. Therefore, it must be destroyed by jihad. This is exactly the Islamic context in which the widespread resurgent use of Jew annihilationist apocalyptic motifs, exemplified by the Hamas Charter and the utterances most recently of Wa'el al-Zarad, would be an anticipated, even commonplace occurrence. Unfortunately, the orthodox Islamic archetypes of Jew hatred promulgated by Hamas are also being disseminated by the most respected mainstream Islamic institutions. Muhammad Sayyid Tantawi wrote these words in his 700-page treatise rationalizing Muslim Jew hatred. Uh, it's called Jews in the Quran and the Traditions. Originally published in 1968-69 and then reissued in 1986. Here's what he wrote. The Quran describes the Jews with their own particular degenerate characteristics, i.e. killing the prophets of Allah. Quran, again, Quran 261-3-1-12. Corrupting his words by putting them in the wrong places consuming the people's wealth frivolously, refusal to distance themselves from the evil they do, and other ugly characteristics caused by their deep-rooted lasciviousness. Only a minority of the Jews keep their word. All Jews are not the same. The good ones become Muslims, Quran 3.113. The bad ones do not. Tantawi was apparently rewarded for this scholarly effort by being named Grand Imam of Al-Azhar in 1996, a position he still holds. These are the expressed, quote, carefully researched views on Jews held by the nearest Muslim equivalent to a pope, the head of the most prestigious center of Muslim learning in Sunni Islam, which represents some 85 to 90 percent of the world's Muslims. 
and Sheikh Tantawi has not mollified such hate-mongering beliefs since becoming the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar as his statements on dialogue in January 1998 with the Jews. The Jews as, quote, enemies of Allah, descendants of apes and pigs, April, 2002, uh, April 2002, and the legitimacy of homicide bombing of, of Jews, April 2002, also make clear. Tantawi's statements on dialogue, which were issued shortly after he met with, chief, with the chief rabbi of Israel, Jacob Lau, in Cairo on December 15, 1997, provided him another opportunity to reaffirm his ongoing commitment to the views expressed about Jews in his Ph.D. thesis. Here's what he said. Anyone who avoids meeting with the enemies in order to counter their dubious claims and stick fingers into their eyes is a coward. My stance stems from Allah's book, the Quran, more than one-third of which deals with the Jews. I wrote a dissertation dealing with them, the Jews, all their false claims and their punishment by Allah. I still believe in everything written in that dissertation, unquote. Alazar's Grand Imam, Alazar Grand Imam Tantawi's case illustrates the prevalence and depth of sacralized normative Jew hatred in the contemporary Muslim world. The uncomfortable examination of Islamic doctrines and history is required in order to understand the enduring phenomenon of Muslim Jew hatred, which dates back to the origins of Islam. Even if all non-Muslim Judeophobic uh, themes were to disappear miraculously overnight from the Islamic world, the living legacy of anti-Jewish hatred and violence rooted in Islam's sacred texts, Quran, Hadith, and Sirah, would remain intact. The assessment and understanding of Islamic anti-Semitism must begin with an unapologetic analysis of the anti-Jewish motifs contained in these foundational texts of Islam. We can no longer view Muslim Jew hatred, including annihilationist strains of this apocalyptic hatred, as a borrowed phenomenon, seen primarily, let alone exclusively, through the prism of Nazism and the Holocaust, the tragic leg legacy of Judeophobic Christian traditions, or the protocols of the elders of Zion from Tsarist Russia. Moreover, the jihad against the Jews is but one aspect, albeit primal, of the jihad to establish global Islamic hegemony. Finally, Julian Benda, in his, in his classic 1928 La, La Traison de Claire, The Treason of the Intellectuals, decried with prophetic accuracy how the abandonment of objective truth about, abetted totalitarian ideologies, which, which led to the cataclysmic destruction of World War II. La Traison de Claire of our time remains the complete failure of Western intellectuals to study, understand, and acknowledge the heinous consequences of the living institution of jihad war and the intimately related doctrine of Islamic anti-Semitism. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Boston. Um, I'm going to make a few remarks and then uh, open the floor to uh, questions and comments. I'll have some remarks about the rules about questions and comments in a minute. Um, as this, uh, the uh, Dr. Balsam's remarks today, um, uh, I think, could be described as taking us from jihad to dhimma to Muslim anti-Semitism. Um, and perhaps I should just make clear, I think, what the line of your, of your approach was. That is, uh, you seek to understand the, this, the uh, particular phenomena of um, uh, hatred of Jews within the larger category of the treatment of non-Muslims generally, which is in itself, uh, by your account, a function of uh, jihad and the, the terms on which jihad can be uh, ended with respect to non-Muslims. So that I undertook to, understood to be the line of, of your presentation today, and I'm, I may come back to that at, 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 uh, a little bit later, but um, I also wanted um, uh, to comment on the book, uh, which uh, doesn't exactly follow that, th that structure, uh, at least partially because you had taken up the question of jihad in your earlier book. So let me say a few things about the book, um, <clears throat> and it's, if I may say, uh, narrower subject of uh, Muslim anti-Semitism. And I want to say, uh, again, as I said earlier, that uh, 
Dr. Balsam's book renders us a service, uh, and I repeat, all of us a service, whatever, uh, whether uh, all of us, at least Americans, whether Jew or non-Jew, and including uh, Muslims. And I would say it does so in uh, two uh, immediate ways. First, it has assembled a prodigious amount of primary and secondary material concerned with this subject, the subject of Muslim anti-Semitism, over the entire long course of Muslim history. It thus permits the reader, hopefully all of you out here, to consult these materials directly and draw uh, your own conclusions. That is to say, it it anthologizes a lot of material which is quoted, uh, which is not referenced, but actually presented. So people can inspect um, uh, the material and, for that matter, inspect Dr. Boston's arguments. I am obliged to say that this assemblage is a burden as well as a blessing, both in its size and, I should add, the dreadful and dreary character of its contents. And this is so even for the morbidly minded, among whom I count myself. So its second mode of assistance is to provide these materials with an introduction which summarizes, summarizes them and provides Dr. Boston's analysis and conclusions. So I'd like to uh, also provide a few remarks about that analysis. Um, Dr. Boston has undertaken this labor, and I think he expressly says this, in part as a corrective to certain current views of the character of contemporary Muslim hatred of Jews. According to that view, contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism is largely the result of two things. It is, to begin with, derivative from modern European anti-Semitism. By modern is meant that form of anti-Semitism which arose in the 19th century in connection with the reaction to the French Revolution and which culminated in Nazism and its murder of six million European Jews. And between the start and the finish of this process, there were many hands to the work, including the czarist police who produced the famous forgery known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. According to this view, the view that uh, Dr. Boston wants to correct, this form of anti-Semitism, which I want to stress again, is, is modern and European, meaning by that it is not Christian, and it derives specifically from the European, from the context of of modern European history. This form of anti-Semitism has enjoyed a second life in the Muslim world after its demise in Europe as a result of the Second World War. It migrated from the one to the other beginning in the 1920s, partially as a result of the efforts of Germans and Nazis to propagandize Muslims. The Nazis' larger purpose, initially the Germans' purpose, was to foment opposition to the colonial rule of its Western European enemies, principally Britain, but also f- both in anticipation of a coming war and during that war, the war that came. This leaves open the question of why it should have survived World War II. And the answer this view provides is, in a way, twofold. First was that the struggle with the West, uh, understood as imperialistic, continued, now understood to be principally represented by the United States. The second was, of course, the establishment of the State of Israel. And I should add that this understanding of contemporary anti-Semitism forms part of a more general view of the character of radical Islam as such, according to which it is primarily a modern ideological movement modeled um, on European and Western uh, predecessors, precedents. A corollary of this view, this understanding, is the view that Muslim-Jewish relations in the pre-modern period were generally benign. One of the most important conclusions that is said to follow from these views is that Muslim anti-Semitism is largely an aberration, an aberration caused by the state of Israel and especially that state's struggle with Palestinian Muslims. It is, moreover, a consequence of alleged injustices visited by Israel on the Palestinians, 
or Israel to shape up, not to mention disappear, all would be well once again between Muslims and Jews. To repeat, Dr. Bossom's book, I think this is a fair presentation of the view that you uh, is meant to be a corrective to that view, or more precisely, a refutation of it. And the burden of that refutation is that Muslim hatred of Jews has a very long history that stretches from the founding of Islam itself up to and through the modern period. Contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism is thus the continuation of pre-modern Muslim views and not the bastard child of Europeans. And he has placed in evidence texts which express that hatred, and I should add, the contempt in which Jews were held. This contempt, which embraced Christians as well, had the formal legal expression to which uh, Dr. Boston referred, the designation of Jews and Christians as so-called dhimmis. And it, is, it was true that as a result of that status, Jews and Christians were permitted to avoid embracing Islam and maintain their religious practices. But that came at a price, a little pr- literal price and a figurative one. The former entailed the payment of a special tax. The latter entailed restrictions meant to humiliate Jews and Christians. Thus, these conditions belie the notion of a benign Muslim past for Jews, not to mention Christians. Toleration there was, but this did not amount to decent and fair treatment, nor did it simply prevent worse from time to time. Pogroms which murdered Jews, in some cases thousands in number, uh, innumerable acts of degrading humiliation, cases of forced and even mass conversions. What if this, this is the portrait I think that um, your book uh, presents and is des- des- uh, des- uh, designed to support. So what of this portrait that Dr. Boston has drawn or that his documents draw? It is, alas, in the main accurate and is a much needed corrective to the rosy view of the situation of Jews under Muslim rule. And if we have time, we can actually discuss how that view arose. But I want to dwell for a moment on the most general feature of the pre-modern period to which I alluded uh, before. That is, that Muslim anti-Semitism was a composite of two things, hatred and contempt. Of course, both are repulsive, but they are not the same thing. It was one thing to murder Jews, another to denounce them as pigs and monkeys, although the latter could lead to the former. Moreover, hatred and contempt were not embraced at all times with equal vigor. For the greater part of this period, with some exceptions, contempt topped the charts. This is hardly surprising. As is illustrated in some of Dr. Boston's documents, the founding of Islam was understood to involve the supersession of both Judaism and Christianity. But practically speaking, In worldly terms, Judaism had already been superseded by Christianity. At the time of the founding of Islam, apart from the limited independence of a few groups of Jews, oddly enough, and perhaps tragically enough, to be found in Arabia, in Medina and Kaibar, Jews were ruled by others and thus contemptible already. The situation was otherwise with Christians, They were in principle also contemptible and were treated as such when they came under Muslim rule, but in practice they were not yet globally so. In the interest of a full understanding of our topic, all these features deserve further elaboration, but our time does not permit that. So let me say that I mention these features partially for the sake of an accurate portrait of the pre-modern period, but more importantly for the sake of understanding contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism to which I now turn. I agree with Dr. Boston that a lot of the language of today's anti-Semitism is continuous with its tradition. How could I not? It is one of my unfortunate duties and now habits to listen to Friday's sermons or to read other public declarations of the sort that some of which Dr. Boston cited. And scarcely, scarcely a week goes by when I am not treated to declarations that the Jews, let me stress Jews, not Israelis, not Zionists, are pigs and apes, uh, references to verses in the Quran which uh, attack, uh, criticize Jews, of course here necessarily Jews and not Zionists, 
and certain hadith which Dr. Boston cites. However, it is also a significant fact that this traditional language has been heavily augmented by the vile products of modern European anti-Semitism. In particular, uh, though not exclusively, the protocols of the elders of Zion and various uh, Nazi texts. These have been embraced and absorbed in such a way as to inform the perspective of today's Muslim anti-Semitism. And um, this cannot but have an important cause and important consequences. But those can best be considered after addressing another contemporary factor, the establishment of the State of Israel. I think it is undeniable that this has had an impact But let me immediately say and stress that my view has little to nothing to do with the hostile view to which Dr. Boston objects, the view that the problem is alleged Israeli injustices. Quite the contrary. I think it is demonstrable by certain brute facts and should be undeniable that Israel is the just party in its struggles. By brute facts, I mean the following. The common understanding of a just solution and one which is, in addition, which has in addition the sanction of international law, is the so-called two-state solution. By that criterion, Israel is and has to be the just party. It accepted it in 1947, 1949, 1967, and, of course, most significantly in the summer of 2000. For good measure, I might add 1937, when the solution was first proposed by the Peel Commission. The problem has been and is and will continue to be Until such time as things change, the unwillingness of other parties, with the partial exception today of Egypt and Jordan, to accept this solution as well. So, to repeat, the problem is not the justice of the State of Israel. And I would add that I do not believe that the problem is primarily Muslim perceptions of Israel's injustice, at least not in the sense that non-Muslims discuss it. What is then the problem, and why do the State of Israel have an effect on contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism. I believe the problem was most simply and profoundly this. Jewish rule, self-rule, and independence anywhere, let alone in Palestine, was a completely unexpected event and almost inexplicable from the point of view of the Muslim tradition. It was hardly compatible with the view that the Jews were and are the contemptible treatise of a history of history destined to disappear sooner or later. And this was reinforced by the repeated Muslim failures to destroy it. Um, Dr. Boston, among his selections, are some citations from a speech given by the former president of Malaysia, Dr. Uh, Mahathir, who raises the question, how could it be that 1.3 billion Muslims cannot destroy a state of 6 million Jews? He raises this as um, as a question and a problem, a problem not only as a practical problem, but a problem of understanding. Um, what I'm uh, saying, in other words, is for this event and situation, the founding of a state by Jews, the Muslim tradition, including traditional Muslim anti-Semitism, had made little to no provision. The most one can point to and um, Dr. Boston mentions this, uh, was the Dajjal, uh, a figure from Muslim apocalyptic traditions who is uh, usually described as the Jewish Antichrist, and various other traditions about the end of days. Um, but I must say that uh, although this, this char- the Dajjal is um, today useful and available for Muslim anti-Semitism, uh, it and these traditions did not play a huge role in the past, um, t- to some degree precisely because there was much more greater preoccupation with Christian uh, enemies. Um, so it seems to me that it is here and for this reason that one can understand the benefit and role conferred by modern European anti-Semitism. For its notions of sinister Jewish world power and alternatively uh, quasi-bacteriological uh, menace, um, a theme, uh, you know, a, um, a way of conceiving of the, of the Jewish problem that really arose in the 19th century and really gathered steam in the 20th century and whose 
uh, most explicit opponent, exponent right now is the president of Iran, Ahmadinejad. Uh, these things were more serviceable than the Muslim tradition taken uh, exclusively by itself. Um, I'm not sure, but I, I suspect that I, I uh, perhaps uh, we disagree on a little bit on, on where to put the emphasis in this regard. I believe I don't have to underscore the dangers involved in this evil brew in general, but as I uh, mentioned at the outset, I'd like to close with a few words on the problems for Muslims themselves. Um, and this has to do with, this I think follows from what I just said about the um, the peculiar mixture of things in contemporary Muslim anti-Semitism. Um, uh, it seems to me the uh, you can see, especially from the adoption of European uh, models of anti-Semitism, uh, the tremendous difficulty um, contemporary Muslim thought has had in understanding the situation of decline um, that the Muslim world has suffered over perhaps the last two to three hundred years, um, and um, a, a tremendous disinclination to face that squarely and think about it, think about what the, the real problems are. Um, and it has taken recourse, uh, and that's not unique in this um, in, in the history of, of anti-Semitism, had taken recourse in anti anti-Semitism as a ma- means of explaining a situation uh, for which it has either no other explanation or no explanation it would like to entertain. Um, this is obviously dangerous for Jews, and it's dangerous for uh, for others, but um, it is also tremendously dangerous for Muslims uh, uh, insofar as it um, stands in the way of um, a task that's necessary for all people when they find themselves in difficulties to uh, look at their situation and uh, uh, apply to it the appropriate uh, critical faculties and try to figure out how what their situation is, how they really got there, <laughs> which, uh, which means not through uh, the exercise of um, a diabolical Jewish power, uh, and what then would, would actually get um, uh, things going again. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, we can now take, um, take some questions, comments. Yes. Okay. By the way, um, could you please identify yourself and um, and do speak into the mic because it um, it really works better when it's closer to your mouth. That's all. Uh, Mark Krikorian. Uh and I wanted to make sort of a comment and a question. But my, and my point is, I think that you're not really disagreeing with Andy. In other words, I think it's perfectly plausible to both look at the legacy of traditional anti-Semitism and its deeply rooted integral nature to uh, to Islam and also view the modern uh, uh, the, the modern elements that it's adopted, whether it's jihad adopting 20th century totalitarian forms in certain respects, or Islamic anti-Semitism adopting certain modern variants from Europe. The fact is the precursor characteristics had to be there for any of that to work. In other words, Hindu nationalism has not adopted a crazy anti-Semitic worldview from 19th and 20th century Europe because it has it, it, the soil isn't there. See, the, the, the pre-existing characteristics aren't there. Um, in other words, it's both traditional anti-Semitism and then one that has expressed itself through certain European forms that they've adopted. I don't think you're necessarily, my sense is you're not really disagreeing. Um, per, no, I, I I have a reasonable suspicion that you're correct, but I think. Um, and, but uh, Andy can speak for himself uh, on this matter. What what I do think is is important is uh, again, yes, it has a very long history. Um, all sorts of things have within Islam have a long history at this point. It's it's a religion that's 
um, that is 1,400 years old. And it, what's uh, all things have a long history, but they, but certain things within there are certain periods within that history where certain things have greater vitality than other things do. Um, or, or they have greater vitality at that time and then at other times. They're there to be drawn upon if people uh, draw upon them. But then the question is really, um, and I remind myself and uh, our audience that we are actually a public policy institution, um, the question is then in the in the given situation, what – what is 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 um, what's going on? Um, it's terribly important to know the history of this because otherwise you wouldn't be able to judge the relative force of one factor or another. But it's it's still important to try to come to some um, understanding of uh, what the current situation is and what the elements are that that go in to make it up. And what I was I, perhaps this was a little bit. Unclear. It, it, to put it bluntly, uh, in the tradition of um, of Muslim attitudes towards non-Muslim religions, there was always there were always two elements: hatred and contempt. Um, and with respect to the Jews, it was hatred and contempt. But it seems to me that you had a, a situation where mostly it was contempt. There were times, precisely as uh, Andy pointed out. Like the episodes in in um, in uh, Spain, Muslim Spain in in uh, the middle of the 11th century, where you have a situation where the Jews seem to have left their station, their contemptible station. Then they become objects of hatred, and then they are t- they're killed. So it um, it's that kind of thing that seems to me important, especially because of the really radical transformation of the situation of both Muslims in the modern period and of Jews. Did you want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah. Um, yeah you can, uh, this should be on, so... Uh, is, can people hear me? Um, yeah, I, just a couple of things. Uh, uh, in, in an attempt to put this book together, uh, by the way, I, I do touch upon um, certainly the, the Nazi era as it, as it affected uh, the Middle East. Um, there, there is no attempt to imply that uh, uh, somehow Nazi anti-Semitism um, was not um, exploited, is not being exploited uh, by, uh, unfortunately, by, by contemporary uh, is- Islamic uh, societies. W- what I, what I wanted to make clear, however, is is that um, even if somehow you were able to Denazify uh, 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 these contemporary Islamic societies, uh, meaning specifically to get rid of these these um, these purely European motifs, that there would still be this groundswell of of potentially annihilationist uh, hatred, which would be uh, exploited. Um, and I, I I once I posed this recently in a hypothetical. Um, to people who I feel, unlike unlike Dr. Frad, can argue too strongly in the in the other direction that that this is essentially uh, a, a Muslim anti-Semitism is a trivial phenomenon uh, essentially until until the 20th century. In other words, I posed a hypothetical that um, had some rump state, rump Jewish state, been created as of the 1922 mandate, and the and the British promptly left. What would have been the fate uh, of that state? And here you'd be in 1922. Uh, you'd be six years before the uh, the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood. You'd be uh, uh, more than a decade before the real rise of, of, of Nazism. Um, and the answer to the that that I was given back was that oh, but of course it would have been destroyed by jihad. Uh, so so, and then and then the prototype, of course, for that kind of destruction not being trivial would be the jihad genocide of the Armenians. The other, the other 19th century massacres of, of populations that, in essence, uh, violated the Dima by their national uh, aspirations. So I, I, I think that this has been a very um, uh, underappreciated phenomenon when it comes to the issue of, of Jewish nationalism, uh, of, of Zionism. The other thing that, that was, a, was stunning to me in doing this, uh, this research was that 
um, the case of Al Jahiz. Al Jahiz uh, was a ninth century uh, polymath, an Arabic polymath, and, and according to the biographical information I could get on him, was actually not terribly religious. He was uh, he was commissioned by the Caliph Mutawakkil, who died in 861, to write what amounted to an anti-Christian uh, polemic. Uh, but uh, Jahiz notices uh, in that contemporary era that the local Muslim population has far more hatred towards the Jews than they do towards the Christians. And he speculates as to why that is. And he goes back and says, because of Quran 582, which I cited to you about about uh, 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 purported uh, uh, Jewish hatred of Muslims as being the major factor, and then, of course, Muhammad's interactions with the Jews of Medina. But because he's a rather secular man, he also throws in another element which just caught me by surprise, which is sort of this, I, I don't know how to put it exactly, sort of a, a Mendelian argument of, of, of Jewish uh, 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 foulness that, that really sounds like uh, like a, a, a pre-modern, non-religious uh, uh, anti-Semitism. So, so I'm saying even even a sort of what we would consider to be a secular motif uh, could be indigenous uh, uh, as well. So, so in essence, uh, my book is an is an attempt to synthesize uh, these indigenous phenomena. And the only thing that that I guess um, I would want to add here is that. Uh, you know, frankly, I think there was a beautiful formulation of how this how this fits together: the the Nazi motifs, the European motifs, uh, and the indigenous motifs. Uh, and it was part of the quote that I that I was reading uh, from Batya Orr. And I and I'd like to just I'd like to just give it to you more in context. She said 35 years ago, the pejorative characteristics of Jews, as they are described in Muslim religious texts, are applied to modern Jews. Anti-Judaism and anti-Zionism are equivalent due to the inferior status of Jews in Islam and because divine will dooms Jews to wandering and misery, the Jewish state appears to Muslims as an unbearable affront and a sin against Allah. Therefore, it must be destroyed by jihad. Here, the pan-Arab and anti-Western theses that consider Israel as an advanced instrument of the West in the Islamic world come to reinforce religious anti-Judaism. The religious and political fuse in a purely Islamic context onto which are grafted foreign elements. If, on the doctrinal level, Nazi influence is secondary to the Islamic base, the technique with which the anti-Semitic material has been reworked and the, and the political purposes being pursued do present striking similarities with Hitler's Germany. The anti-Jewish opinions, uh, that anti-Jewish opinions have been widely spread in Arab nationalist circles since the 1930 is not in doubt, but their confirmation at Al-Azhar University by the most important authorities of Islam, enabled them to be definitively imposed with the cachet of infallible authenticity upon illiterate masses that were strongly attached to religious traditions. And I can't think of a more lucid presentation of, of, of these two arguments. Yes. I just have a question about jihadism. My name is Mark. Question about jihadism in, in general. We're in the election cycle. There's been a lot of talk about that. Uh, Professor Boston, um, are there any politicians, congressmen, senators that, in your opinion, have a very clear understanding of jihadism? Are there any who, in your opinion, are completely off base? Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, answer that question. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I'm yeah, not sure I, that's really an appropriate question for this program. So. I would just say that 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 that, um, and I'm not a political person at all. Um, I, I I'm very very uh, frightened by the lack of understanding of this material in general. Um, I've I've heard a, um, a couple of, of of politicians use the word jihad. You know, we have this we have this uh, recent um, uh, Orwellian uh, pronouncement from the from the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, against the use uh, of the word uh, jihad, um, this is quite frightening. You know, the EU did. The, the EU is always ahead of us in this regard. So they, they did. They did this two years ago, um, and uh, I don't think it's improved their ability to understand or to deal with the threat from jihadism. But I. But but your larger point, uh, just to address it, uh, uh, you know, without without getting into politics, is that a pox on all their houses. They're, 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 no one's dealing with this. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I, 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 
I, I'd like to um, try to have the doctor, a doctor, and the doctor who's not a doctor, um, flesh out a, a distinction which seems to me very important in the language that's been used uh, and has not really uh, been gone into thus far. And that as I, I, I couldn't help noticing that Dr. Fradkin uh, refers again and again to radical Islam uh, and Dr. Bostom is talking about Islam, uh, not radical Islam, Islam. It seems to me Dr. Fratkin is suggesting the problem is radical Islam, and Dr. Bostom is suggesting the problem is Islam. I would like this issue explored to some extent. I'm sorry, I, I didn't, also could you just, for the record, identify yourself, that's all. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Stephen Steinlight and I work for Mr. Kohar. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I think my position is, is, is quite clear. Um, I, I, I think that um, we have to distinguish between Islam, on the one hand, and individual Muslims, on the other hand. Um, I mean, clearly everything that I've written about, researched, described today is, is Islamic doctrine. Uh, so you can't separate that uh, from, Islam, from, from Islam itself, obviously. Um, the, the perseveration on this kind of material is obviously, you know, not the not the um, the day-to-day -day sort of uh, obsession of all Muslims, and I don't believe that. I don't think that that's true. Um, but on the other hand, the authenticity of these doctrines and and uh, you know, I discussed actually yesterday with Dr. Frack and some data, you know, as an epidemiologist, which I found quite frightening. Um, it, to, to give some, and again, within the limitations of the ability to do surveys, I certainly know that as, as an epidemiologist. Just real quickly, uh, these were the data that I that I was uh, quite upset by. Uh, this was a survey done in 4,400 Muslims uh, going west to east, Morocco, Egypt, uh, uh, Pakistan, Indonesia. So you've got the largest Arab Muslim country, Egypt. You've got the largest single Muslim country, uh, non-Arab, uh, Indonesia. Two questions jumped out at me. These were face-to-face -face interviews in local languages. Support for strict, and the word was strict, application of Sharia law. And su support for the, re the establishment or reestablishment uh, of, a, of a global caliphate. The responses to both of those questions in these face-to-face -face interviews, 65% affirmative. Now, they weren't the same. In other words, 65% who, who, who responded yes to strict Sharia were not the same people, 65% who responded yes to wanting a transnational caliphate. Um, so they weren't the same people. Um, but, but, but those kinds of sentiments being so prevalent in, in an instrument which you know, is, is certainly as good as anything out there, I think better than some of the Pew surveys that have been done. Uh, this was done by the University of Mellon, World Opinion Dynamics. D these, are, these are disturbing data, um, but on the other hand, y you know, these are, these are an expression of, of traditional desires, and, and I, I think we, we, have to, we have to be realistic um, uh, uh, about about assessing things that way and and not you know engaging in 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 in, in un unreasonable wishful thinking. I'm so, that's the best I can answer I can give you. Uh, I suppose I'm supposed to go next. I, sh I guess I should start by saying that um, uh, you know, there, there's been a way of, uh, since we're talking in a way about approaches to the current situation, and um, I mean the situation, the threat, the challenge, and so forth. And uh, to follow up on the previous question, who might in our uh, current political constellation be uh, understand it and deal with it? Um, and there has been an argument. There, there's a way of approaching it, um, uh, which uh, has been effectively to define the problem away, uh, to say that there are a great variety of um, Islams um, that, on the one hand, uh, tremendous diversity. So it's almost impossible to say what what anything about coherent about Islam. On the one hand, on the other hand, to say that whatever that might be, uh, radical Islam has nothing to do with it. And I, I, I want to state clearly, this, I believe this is very, very pernicious and has been very damaging. 
On the other hand, there is a distinction between radical Islam and the historical tradition of Islam, including, to some degree, uh, representatives of that tradition today, although the tradition has gotten extraordinarily weak. Um, and there are even important distinctions within radical Islam itself. Um, the difference, it seems to me, if one takes just simply the subject of jihad, is this. There is absolutely no question uh, that jihad um, has means and has meant primarily war. Um, it's uh, it's true in that, uh, as the phrase occurs uh, in um, in the Quran, it's always or usually jihad fi sabilillah, uh, which means struggle in the path of God. But that has traditionally been understood to mean a particular kind of struggle. Um, and yes, there are there have been other no, notions, understandings of that, but the, the, the dominant one has been uh, war. And as a result, uh, jihad has formed a a, um, a part of the perspective and a powerful part of the perspective of Islam historically. Um, and what's more, then various things have followed from that. The, the laws that, uh, of war, of, of which uh, dimitude is essentially one. There's still a difference between that and, say, the perspective of groups uh, like uh, takfir was jihad or al-Qaeda. And the difference is, and even for that matter, a difference between traditional Islam and the perspective of, of um groups like uh, the Ikhwan or the, the Muslim Brotherhood in the, in, in the place that uh, is accorded to jihad. And what, what seems to me both striking and important about radical Islam, which is to say certain modern formations, modern trends, certain movements, is the degree to which they took jihad, which is um, uh, one part, even an honored part of Islam, and made it have have frequently made it the uh, um, aspect of Islam, the the so the the only thing that's in a way important for a contemporary Muslim, in not only in practice but in a certain way in principle that the they poured all the meaning of Islam into into that thing, and as a practical matter, um, this is of course very dangerous, uh, and. Um, and uh but it, it's also important for trying to think about the ways in which uh Muslims who are so inclined uh find their way out of that that perspective that's that's what i would say uh yeah go up there and we'll work our way around this way uh i have Do people hear me yes oh uh, yeah steve coglin no uh, up to the stephen coglin and i have a question um, and I'll start off by the question and kind of fill it in by way of coming back. It's, it'll be quick, though. Um, can it be argued that the model, of, uh, the model of anti-Semitism was set in the very beginning, and then, then we come up with the modern Nazi period, and all that we really have is just taking in new facts or new di- ways of, of understanding anti-Semitism to, to feed a model that has been existing since the beginning? And what I mean by that is uh, you, you, the comment was made about 11th century Andalusia where... Uh, some of the Jews in Spain decided to, to maybe reassert themselves, and then you had dramatic anti-Semitism. And then coming today with what you know you were saying, the, the foundation of the modern Jewish state, and it happened in their presence. So you had a, an extreme example of rejecting dimitude in their presence. And that, to me, it seems like we focus on what happened in Europe as the intellectual or new, new reality that caused new understanding of anti-Semitism, but maybe what it really is is these things happen side by side, and that the foundation of a new Islamic, uh, new Jewish state, then just basically initiated a new round of uh, extremely hostile anti-Semitism, based on the fact that they have rejected their dimma status, which has historically happened through time. So that that would be my question. Um, I, you know, I, obviously, obviously, I'm more sympathetic to, to that to that view, um, and. Uh, 
Um, again, I, I, I just I, I think that I think that uh, the the, um, the the creation of Israel is is such an, an affront to the Islamic order, uh, both both in the corporeal world and es- eschatologically. Um, that uh, I'm really I, I, again I'm, I, it's open it's all speculation in the end, but but I, I just I just don't know how you could um, uh, really. Uh, uh, Add any intensity in an Islamic context uh, to to that kind of event uh, 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 in terms of uniting the global ummah in an effort to, uh, to destroy uh, Israel. Now, the part that gets more problematic for me, and uh, and again, this is all exercises in conjecture, is 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 the is the disseminating out away from Israel of of, of sort of global uh, Jew hatred. And and here, I, you know, I think it's I think it's perf- perfectly reasonable to speculate that that uh, European motifs, etc., uh, could 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 play a, could play a role. But when it comes to this obsession to destroy Israel. I think that fits fits quite neatly uh, within a purely um, uh, is, Islamic uh, Islamic context. Um, but again, you know, in the end, I'm not sure how much it matters. Uh, the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, we we know that if if again if we did everything to denazify these societies, as was done in Germany itself, um, that that it would not. Um, Alleviate uh, these these uh, independently annihilationist motifs. Yeah, yeah um, I think I would say the following. I I think you're correct that, that they're sort of parallel. But the question is, um, and uh, Dr. Boston is perfectly correct that there are grounds within the tradition for objecting to the establishment of the State of Israel. The standard one is that uh, by virtue of, of uh, conquest, this has become, all of Palestine has become a waqf uh, and uh, a religious endowment. And um, I don't know if there are any non-Muslims who incline to this argument, but I would suggest to them that they, if they are so inclined, they realize that it also applies to has a broader application. It means also Spain, southern France, Sardinia, Corsica, Sicily, Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, and so forth. Uh, the Ukraine, parts of Ukraine, southern Russia, and the Crimea. That that would be one objection, and that objection is often the way in which things are put. Um, that the um, so you can have in a way three side by side. You could have the Jews are terrible. They should you know the, the, we are. Um, locked in moral struggle for eternity with them, uh, they certainly don't have a state, or then the other kinds of arguments that you have um, um, are with regard to Israel. What it seems to me, and perhaps I didn't put this clearly enough, it's not only um, the, the, the whether uh, a, a Jewish state has the right, but the how. And it seems to me that the how is is really and has to somehow obsess um, Muslim anti-Semites because the, it, again it looks it looks very bizarre. It looks bizarre at several levels. One is this should never have happened at all. It is not the script, the historical script, that is implied in the Muslim, Islam's self-understanding of what its role relationship is between it and Judaism and Christianity. A. But that it happens uh, on such a small base. I mean, if, in other words, if Jews were suddenly a hundred million or two million, two hundred million or or a half of a billion, okay, it somehow makes a bit of sense how, that they could accomplish. But but this is a very small group. I mean, there's six million Jews in in in. Um, uh, in Israel today, and at the time of its founding, there were six hundred thousand Jews, but yet the state got founded. So the point is, how can that be? It can't be. be and I think this is the the line of reflection that links it up to modern European anti-Semitism. It can't be the Jews themselves, or it can't be this group of Jews. There must be some larger explanation other than the fact that the Israelis um, are eager to defend their lives and have figured out how to do it. 
it must be a kind of wider Jewish conspiracy, but even that wouldn't explain it because there are, after all, only 12 million Jews. Um, it must be that Jews control larger forces which can accomplish this. And at that point, you are in the midst of, in the center of, the kind of anti-Semitism that was developed in um, in modern Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. The idea of this, that uh, there is a, a capacity within Jews to control other people uh, and leverage, so to speak, their what would be otherwise be their uh, marginal and intrinsic uh, power. Just, just one quick comment. Um, yes, yes and no, because you can go back to 1291 during the terrible Baghdad pogroms when Saad Abdallah, uh, a, a Jewish uh, 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 assistant actually to, to a Mongol ruler, but over a, over a Muslim community, was deposed. And again, apes and pigs were invoked, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the usual. Um, and in the massacres, and there were massacres that spread out from, from Baghdad, one of, the mo- one, of the, one of the propaganda motifs that was distributed, this is the end of the 13th century, was that uh, Saud had, had, had advised the, this forest to be chopped down, ships built, to sail to Mecca and, and take over the Kaaba. Okay, so, so Jewish conspiratorial thinking was, was available indigenously uh, you know, in, in the 13th century on a scale that I never would have, would have imagined. Um, so okay. I, 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 you know, it, 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 it is, again, it, there, there's, you, these are all, again, these are all speculations, but, but there is a conspiratorial um, uh, uh, strain within Islam which would tap into other things. The other thing that's commonly not understood is that in the Sunni historiography, you know, the whole Shiite-Sunni split is, is because of Jews. It is, it is a renegade Yemenite Jew, uh, Abdallah ibn Saba, who created Shiism. In, in, in essence, this is this is Tabari writes about this, and I include his his discussion of this fact. So, so this sort of conspiratorial um, uh, 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 obsession is not unique to to Europe, to Christendom, to to to, to modern uh, uh, movements. And the other thing is that even at the period of of what we would consider to be a much more Arab nationalist uh, secular uh, um, uh, current of thought. Uh, amongst Palestinian society, uh, Abu Iyad made this remarkable statement. He was second in command to Arafat. Uh, he made the statement in 1974. He says, we intend to struggle so that our Paris- Palestinian homeland does not become a new Andalusia. So, so uh, uh, you know, these motifs uh, really seem to transcend even, even periods that appear to be secular or pseudo, pseudo-secular. Uh, we'll take one in the back and then we'll move forward. Thank you. I'm John Lewis. If you surveyed Japanese in 1930 or the Germans in 1934 and asked how many of the general population were in favor of of launching a world war, I think you'd have a very small minority who wanted to do that and the majority who would be opposed to it. Nevertheless, the the majority of the moderates did not set the direction for the events. It was, we might say, the extremists, the most consistent, the most fundamentalist in their interpretation who set that direction. And, of course, an end to those threats required repudiation and defeat of that ideology, both ideologies, and including complete reform of the educational systems. Uh, This would have enormous implications for this subject here, Uh, most of all the need to confront the Koran itself directly and to somehow bring about profound educational change. Uh, Comment on that, please. Well... Um, I suppose what I would have to say in response to that, I, I, I share um, your view that it, it's in general the case that dedicated uh, minorities um, uh, provide leadership, and if they're fanatical, uh, so much the worse. Um, the question is, uh, you know, how to... Uh, so the, the issue would be, um, can one find a path to uh, at least a, a calmer uh, perspective on the part of Muslims, uh, calmer, or as we say now, moderate. Um, I would say that, um, you know, this is, this, um, is uh, obviously something that Muslims have to do for themselves. 
not it would not ne- merely be for themselves. It might be on our behalf as well, but it would have to do for themselves. But as I suggested at the, the outset, one way to one place to start would be to reflect on Muslim anti-Semitism, and in that respect. I would would emphasize that Dr. Boston, as I said at the outset, had done a service not only to us but to them. And the reason is that um, it has come to play such a powerful part in um, in contemporary Muslim uh, perspective, and is again leaving aside what what harm it does to others, including Jews. Um, deeply uh, damaging of any effort, it seems to me, on the part of Muslims to to um, look reasonably at their situation and find a, a path forward. So that would, it, it seemed to me, in a way, one could say it's the most important thing for them to look at is this, this phenomenon and to face it, um, whether they will or not. It obviously depends on them. I... I I would just suggest that uh, people take a look at the questioner's own uh, uh, research on on what what the United States did during during uh, the reconstruction of Japan. Uh, Professor Lewis has written um, um, some brilliant analysis uh, of of what was done during the reconstruction period, um, and one of the memos uh, that um, I learned from reading his work uh, talked about a directive from the. Uh, uh, State Department, uh, and and with regard to you know to 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 radical Shinto, if you want to call it that, uh, the dissemination of Japanese militaristic and ultra nationalistic ideology in any form will be completely suppressed, and the Japanese government will be required to cease financial and other support of Shinto establishments. Now, I think that that we could certainly substitute uh, <coughs> jihadist Islam at least for that for Shinto in this in this same context. Um, the problem is uh, we're not occupying. We're not <laughs> occupying exactly. We haven't. We haven't. We haven't taken down. Uh, 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 well, other than other than an opportunity, which uh, my editorial opinion might have been squandered, you know, in in Iraq with regard to uh, you know Bremer's uh, I think sane objection to to having the constitution based on Sharia. I, I, he objected to that, and uh, obviously he was overruled. Um, and even that might not, might not nearly be the same kind of analogy that, that Professor Lewis has worked through so elegantly with regard to Japan because it was a much different kind of occupation. But the kernel of that seems to be uh, in, in, in the analysis uh, that Professor Lewis has done with respect to, to Japan. Uh, oh, well, okay. Uh, back there first and then Mr. Lund. Um, Andrew Gilbert. Um, in 2000, um, the... Uh, the Pope visited uh, the Church of St. John in Damascus, and I uh, recall that Assad used the opportunity to sort of launch a kind of typical, though it was surprising then, this pre-9-11 uh, uh, diatribe against Israel. And what struck me then as sort of an offer to the head of the, the Roman Catholic Church of, uh, of sort of an alliance uh, to deal with that essential problem. And I'm Wondering, is there anything in sort of uh, Islamic theology, radical otherwise, for this notion of uh, uh, sort of alliance with the lesser and perhaps from their sites, you know, sort of weaker eschatologically uh, or co derivative uh, uh, enemy, uh, uh, a co derivative religion, but, uh, uh, you know, with Christendom to sort of deal with, um, with sort of the, the, the sort of the parent. Uh, 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 religion. Is there something in the, the, the children will get together yeah. to knock off grandpa? Right. <laughs> uh, well, you know, first of all, the motif that, uh, um, that, uh, Bashar Assad, uh, in, invoked was, was the, was the prophet killing, uh, motif. I mean, it was, the, it's the central Quranic <laughs> motif updated, uh, as he did, uh, with, uh, the same sort of archetypal logic with the, with the, uh, uh poisoning of Muhammad, uh, himself. Um, you know, there's the the um, one of the strongest centers of resistance to the implementation of Vatican II came from the Islamic world. Uh, so you could, I guess, view that as uh, as as sort of a, an attempt to maintain uh, a, a, a pre-Vatican II anti-Semitic alliance. I I I, I, don't, I don't know. 
but but um, because of the Muslim's own views of of how uh, uh, Jews and Christians uh, should should behave and 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 what the what the theology tells them, they could not accept Vatican II uh, and thought it was a terrible affront that the Jews should be um, acquitted of of this charge of deicide, even though they don't really believe in in deicide itself. They believe that a that a body double essentially was was killed, but but regardless, uh, the Jews should should not be exculpated uh, fr- from this crime. Um, so, I, I, I uh, it's it's um, uh, I, I think I think the 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 attempt, however, to to uh, unite uh, Christian and and Muslim anti-Semitism uh, is not something to be uh, overlooked. Yeah, I, I guess I. Um, there's obviously some. Um, they would certainly like to have allies in in this endeavor, um, uh, and also feel to some degree more intimidated by the power of Christianity in the world. Uh, it was really quite uh, interesting um, in connection with the. Um, uh, the speech that uh, Pope Benedict gave in Ratzenberg, in uh, Regensburg, um, there were objections, but there was also deep concern that he might actually mean some of the things that he said and um, what its implications might be. So uh, there's a kind of, um, I mean, to put it another way, after the, the I, I believe this is the case, after the Danish cartoon affair, um, there were um, Christians killed. Uh, there was a, a Catholic priest uh, who was the student of a friend of mine who was killed in Turkey. At, um, after the speech in Regensburg, I don't believe the, um, uh, the, the same happened. There was some. There, there was a kind of in, uh, sense that Christianity is really, when it speaks, is very, very powerful. Still very powerful. Uh, and that was reflected a few months later in a, an open letter that was put together by a variety of Muslim scholars, um, which is an interesting document. It's called, I think, uh, For a Common Word. And it does try to um, elaborate the ways in which Christianity and Islam are, are on the same page. Uh, Jews were mentioned in passing in that document. Yes, Josh. Uh, Josh London. Um, given the, the recent, uh, uh, say, switchover of, of uh, a certain, well, let me rephrase, there, there's a recrudescence, perhaps, of, of the uh, what would be traditional understandings of uh, jihad, uh, jihadist ideology in Islam, and the nature of that uh, being more representative of the Islamic faith than what was otherwise passing for sort of PC. You know, Islam is religion of peace sort of thing. So a recrudescence of that after 9-11, greater awareness by people who otherwise don't, hadn't paid attention to these things, and perhaps a, a stronger backlash by a certain academic and other establishment saying that, no, this is all nonsense and scaremongering, and it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But given that sort of dynamic and struggle, particularly in academia, but generally, I think, in intellectual circles, when you find, for example, historian Benny Morris suddenly saying, oh, yes, 48 was all about jihad, you know, and he's some, somehow finding this new truth and that otherwise he hadn't uh, asserted in his work quite that way, what do you think, uh, either of you, is the, the future for general discourse, certainly in the West, particularly in the United States, as to the nature of, of, of this sort of back and forth between these not quite schools of thought, but 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 attitudes or approaches to grappling with the actual problems that that we face with the global war on terror, and based on that sort of back and forth, are you largely optimistic, pessimistic about the uh, sort of a public intellectual ability to continue to grapple with these ideas in a workable public policy framework uh, moving forward? What, what uh, could you just say? What you mean by the schools? The relevant well, I, schools isn't quite the word, but well, basically, meant, but right, but various the, groups. On the one hand, there's the uh, there's the the no, there's the those who have always maintained that that there uh, is a realistic uh, threat 
from jihad in the Islamic world and point to many of the, you know, the sort of the bloody historical battles and say, well, this was jihad, Barbary Wars jihad, uh, you know, uh, fight against Israel jihad, versus what had otherwise been the mainstream view by academia that, oh, no, no, that's uh, cloaking in religion, but it's about this, it's about that, it's nationalism, it's commerce, it's... Uh, and even now, I think that you still have that kind of back and forth between, you know, uh, the the old school, if you will, that say, well, jihad has always meant this, and this is what this is how to understand that history, versus the crowd that, you know, that is otherwise in the mainstream, certainly institutionally, that still maintains that that scaremongering and that's not accurate and that's not what's going on. Uh, just a, the only comment just uh, f- f- we're on a bad trajectory with regard to what you've just outlined um, and I think the only way to correct that uh, is to have discussions like we're having today uh, but I think perhaps more importantly um, this came up just yesterday uh, d- during during a, a briefing and then very nice uh, exchange I had yesterday at the in the same building at the ethics and public policy center um, th- about the need to teach the basic history of the jihad to, for argument's sake, high school students. Uh, I, I, I think this is critical. I mean, we've all been told that, that, quote, students need to learn more about Islam. Well, let's learn about, you know, the way we used to teach dates and facts history about the campaigns, etc. How, how, how did Islam uh, spread from Arabia to Portugal to, to, to the Indian subcontinent? Let's let's just go through the way we describe battles and histories for European history, etc. Let's let's teach that. Let's teach that to to high school students uh, if if they're supposed to learn about Islam. I, I think that's a very important starting place. Um, I um, I would say it's a very very deep problem at this point. Uh, I've been a student of Islam for more than forty years at this. Point, which means I'm very long in the tooth, and I may need Doctor <laughs> Boston <laughs> services if so. Um, and uh, the 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 character of uh, the views that you described, I, I go back at least to that that period. Um, and uh, in general, uh, if one might put it this way, a, a fairly non-historical. Um, approach to the subject, rather more si- social scientific, um, prevailed, I think, pretty much utterly until, uh, for looking at contemporary issues, up until uh, the revolution of 1979 in Iran. Um, and, and at that point, there was, it, it, it almost came to pass that people said there was something wrong in the way in which we are looking at this region. Um, that the, the there seems to be this force there known as religious belief and practice that is capable of driving politics and shaping and forming politics, both certainly in that case for ill and also perhaps for good. But whichever way, that, that was the a sort of moment at which um, should have almost did force a rethinking and uh, ultimately did not. Um, and... Um, the I think this has gone on, you know, steadily uh, uh, since. I mean, there there is a uh, more of a kind of historical discourse, but but there is very little inclination to apply it to present circumstances. Um, the only difference I would say between now and then, or now when uh, uh, and when I started studying Islam um, and. Um, I studied with people like Muhsin Mahdi and Fazlur Rahman, is that now it's very much more dangerous not to take this view. And it made a certain, it made some, it was more plausible then because, uh, let's say 1968, 1969, uh, was the end of the period in which modern secular ideologies mattered a great deal in, in the Muslim world of nationalism, of Arab socialism, uh, and so forth. That was uh, that was coming to an end. Um, now that has ended, and and it's, uh, whether it's radical Islamic or Islamic sensibility that has, um, when sp- speaking of, that has been the dominant and growing 
uh, uh, factor in the Muslim world for the last 35 years. So it's particularly inappropriate at this point. Yes, and then I think we should probably get it. you got to go, right? I already missed my flight. Are you sure? Yeah, keep going. <laughs> Not well, but there's still the... Yes. So. Yes, um, <clears throat> my name is Gary Kuyper, and I was just wanting to know if you could comment on the current negotiations between Israel and Syria, and if they are successful, just how um, how important that would be in the area. Would it further isolate Iran? If you could just comment on that, thank you. Um, I, I I must confess it's I, I it's outside my expertise. Uh, I, I can't I, I just from a uh, the limited the limited understanding that I that I have um, I, I I can't see uh, how conceding the Golan Heights uh, can do anything to uh, secure Israel, um, but. Uh, that's that's my basic bottom line. I want to say I, I think it will come to naught, and uh, it will come to naught because, um, and especially the its its objective, if that's the objective to to um, uh, separate Syria, from the Syrian regime from Iran at this point, um, what Israel has to offer. Um, uh, even in the form of the Golan, is not cannot make up for what Syria needs from Iran uh, in the form of support, a strategic alliance, and backing for what's infinitely more important to it, as it has shown over the years, the control of Lebanon. So I don't think anything is going to come of it. And I'm rather perplexed that the Israelis uh, have launched on this venture. The, the only formal sense it makes... To me, is that formally speaking, you could say, if they could remove that issue from the set of things that their military planners have to take care of, it would be uh, <laughs> give them one less headache to solve. But uh, otherwise, I don't, I don't see anything. Um, I, I guess that's that's it. Thank you all for for coming, and please thank our speakers. Andrew Bostom is the author of The Legacy of Jihad, Islamic Holy War, and the Fate of Non-Muslims. He's an M.D. and an Associate Professor of Medicine at Brown University. Mr. Bostom has published numerous articles and commentaries on Islam in the Washington Times, National Review Online, and American Thinker. For more information, visit andrewbostom.org. David Hilliard, a founding member of the Black Panther Party, edited the book 